What is reality when no one is looking? Who are we behind the thoughts we think all day long? And what if consciousness isn't something we have, but something we are, and something the entire universe is too? Consciousness is a vast field, and the ego is just a small island within it, wrote Carl Jung. Alan Watts once challenged us with another unsettling idea. You don't come into this world, you come out of it, and then comes the discomfort, is what I call my mind really mine. All of us, at some point, have experienced a kind of break from the ordinary, a brief yet intense feeling that something more is happening behind the veil of routine. Maybe while walking down the street, sitting quietly on a park bench, or getting lost in a video like this one, suddenly the world seems to shift slightly away from normality, as if we're watching a play where each person is the star of their own stage, and no one, absolutely no one, is watching the same show we are. This phenomenon, described as sound, is the sudden awareness that every person, every face in the crowd, is living a life as complex, intense, and unique as our own. As David Foster Wallace wrote, everyone is infinitely complex inside, but almost no one acts like it's true. When this realization hits, there's a silent unraveling of one of the deepest pillars of human illusion, that there is a central narrative and that we're in it. But what happens when we stop merely observing the world and start observing the observer? When we turn our gaze inward into consciousness itself and begin to investigate what lies behind experience, the answers, or rather the questions that arise, have unsettled philosophers, physicists, and seekers for centuries. The closer we look at reality, the stranger it seems. And perhaps, as Werner Heisenberg once said, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. This video is an invitation. What if you began to investigate not just what reality is, but what is looking at it? Get ready. From this moment on, strange things start to happen. Picture yourself sitting on a subway, staring at the faces around you. Each of those faces belongs to someone carrying an entire world within. Secret lives, memories no one else has seen, hopes that have never been spoken out loud. Each person, a galaxy of meaning, orbiting through the city's streets. The human mind, in that instant, finds itself staring into a shattered mirror where every fragment reflects an autonomous existence. The word for this kind of realization is sond, a strange term for an even stranger feeling. The sudden awakening to the fact that everyone else is living a life just as vivid, dense, and real as your own. This perception can be unsettling. It shatters the ego's central fantasy, that we are the protagonist of a linear storyline. We're not. No one is. There isn't a single narrative, but billions of them, intertwining, colliding, drifting apart all the time. Philosopher Thomas Nagel called this ability to step outside oneself, the view, from nowhere. The moment when, however briefly, we free ourselves from the egocentric lens and glimpse the vastness of other people's subjectivities. But why does this shake us so deeply? because consciousness may be the only thing that is both utterly familiar and at the same time, utterly mysterious. How is it possible that we live inside something we can never fully observe from the outside? We are the eye that can never see itself. And when we begin to question consciousness, what it is, where it comes from, whether it's unique or shared, strange things truly do start to happen, not in the outside world, but within the internal framework of how we perceive reality. Seeing yourself as just one among billions isn't diminishing yourself. It's actually honoring the mystery. It's understanding that, while we are each unrepeatable, we are also interdependent. Consciousness is like a theater where every spectator is also on stage, lit by their own inner light, but the spotlights cross, touch, and shine on the same objects. Author Italo Calvino once wrote, each person is an invisible city that will never be fully mapped. And in recognizing this, we awaken something deeper than empathy. We awaken cosmic humility. And then comes the inevitable question. If all these realities are happening simultaneously, with none fully accessible to another, what does that say about reality itself? Is it the sum of all these consciousnesses, an average, or something even more mysterious, something that exists between minds? Physicist and thinker Carlo Rovelli says, The world is not made of things, but of events. And consciousness seems to be the stage where these events become possible, a place where the raw material of existence is transformed into meaning, story, emotion. We began this video with a feeling of separation, 
of strangeness. But perhaps what makes all of this even stranger is realizing that we're all connected by the same invisible thread, the ability to perceive, to feel, to imagine. Consciousness, this phenomenon we can't explain yet can't live without, is what unites us, even when everything else seems to divide us. Have you ever stopped to think about what you believe to be real, what you can touch, measure, predict, the solidity of the world, the continuity of time, the logic of events? Now imagine all of that shattering like a mirror under pressure. Welcome to quantum physics, where reality becomes a matter of perspective and the world seems to exist only when you look at it. The idea sounds absurd, but it's well-founded. In the early 20th century, experiments began to reveal something deeply unsettling. Subatomic particles like electrons and photons don't have a defined position until they are measured. In the iconic double-slit experiment, for example, Particles behave like waves when unobserved, interfering with one another as if they were just possibilities floating in the void. But the moment they are observed, they collapse into particles with defined trajectories. The simple act of looking changes the behavior of the world. As physicist John Archibald Wheeler once said, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. This realization gave rise to two major schools of interpretation. On one side, the realist, like Albert Einstein, argued that the universe exists independently, objectively, with fixed properties, whether or not they are being observed. On the other side, the anti-realists, like Niels Bohr, claimed that these properties only exist when they are measured. In other words, reality is not something ready-made, but something that happens in the act of observation. Einstein, unsettled, once asked ironically, do you really believe the moon isn't there when no one is looking? But the data, stubborn as it was, kept contradicting his intuition. And perhaps the most shocking revelation came with the phenomenon of quantum entanglement. In 1972, physicist John Clauser conducted an experiment that proved particles that had once interacted continued to influence each other, even when separated by vast distances. It was as if, by measuring one, the other instantly decided its state, without there being any physical time for information to travel between them. This violated a basic principle of classical physics, locality, the idea that things can only be influenced by what is nearby. Decades later, Clauser, along with Alain Aspect and Anton Zeilinger, would be awarded the Nobel Prize for proving what Einstein feared. The universe is not locally real. In other words, the properties of things are neither fixed nor independent, and they can influence each other instantaneously across distance. Reality, it seems, quite literally builds itself as we observe it. The impact of this revelation goes beyond physics. It shakes our philosophical perception of the world. If the act of observation changes what is observed, what does that say about the role of consciousness in all of this? Are we merely passive receivers of a pre-existing world, or are we co-creators of the very fabric of reality? This is where physics and metaphysics meet. When the observer becomes an inseparable part of the observed system, the entire notion of objectivity begins to crumble. Philosopher and physicist David Bohm suggested that the universe is not made of things, but of relationships, a constant dance of information, where the observer is just another particle within the great flow. The quantum world reveals an unstable universe, constantly in the making where possibilities coexist until a choice is made. But a choice by whom? And what does that choice even mean? When faced with the strangeness of reality at its core, we are forced to let go of certainties. And perhaps that's where the true investigation of consciousness begins, not as something isolated in our heads, but as an active participant in the very unfolding of the cosmos. So far, we've seen that the world isn't as solid as it appears. That reality, on a microscopic level, changes depending on how it's observed. But this leads us to an even more unsettling question. What does it mean, exactly, to observe? What does it mean to measure? And why would this have the power to define the very existence of things? In an attempt to understand the role of observation in reality, physicist John Archibald Wheeler proposed a bold idea. The universe is participatory. It doesn't just exist, it responds. For Wheeler, Reality is made up of fundamental units of information. Not matter, not energy, but information. Every time a question is asked, every time a choice is made about how to measure, 
observe, or interact with the world, that information is recorded. And this isn't just a metaphor, it's the very structure of existence. This view is known as the participatory observer principle. Its essence is both simple and profound. We are not outside the universe, analyzing it as if we were scientists observing a detached experiment. We are inside it, and every act of consciousness, every glance, every intention helps to build what we call real. The foundation of this theory lies in the notion that reality organizes itself like a network of responses to binary questions. Yes or no, presence or absence, choice A or choice B. And here's the most fascinating part. Experiments based on Wheeler's hypothesis have shown that the way something is observed can influence how it behaved in the past. That's right. A present decision can affect events that seem to have already happened. But this isn't about time travel. It's about something even more fundamental. Reality is not fully defined until an interaction occurs. The world, therefore, isn't a finished structure waiting to be discovered. It's a living web of possibilities that takes shape as we interact with it. This conception invites us to a new understanding of the role of consciousness. It's not a passive byproduct of the physical universe. It is, perhaps, a fundamental part of the mechanism. If that's true, then we are more than observers. We are creative agents, co-creators of the fabric of reality. But this also brings an immense responsibility. Because if reality responds to the way we relate to it, then our worldview, our intentions, our way of being in the world, affect more than just our individual experience. They affect the world itself. Philosopher and neuroscientist Thomas Metzinger argues that human consciousness creates a tunnel of reality, an internal model we believe to be the real world. But this model is filtered, edited, subjective. The universe itself might be something radically different from what we're able to perceive. And yet, we interact with it deeply, as if our choices had the power to shape it. We are like navigators who, by drawing the map, also draw the very territory. In this sense, the idea of a participatory universe is not just a scientific speculation. It's also a philosophical provocation. It invites us to live with more presence, more awareness more responsibility, because on some level, every gesture we make contributes to the invisible fabric that holds the world together. What if we've been looking at the phenomenon of consciousness the wrong way from the very beginning? What if, instead of asking, how does matter produce consciousness, we should be asking, how does consciousness express itself through matter? This radical shift in perspective is the starting point of one of the most controversial and thought-provoking theories in the philosophy of mind, panpsychism. It suggests that consciousness is not something that emerges only in highly complex brains like the human one, but rather a fundamental property of the universe, just as basic as mass or gravity. In other words, everything, at some level, is conscious. Not conscious in the human sense, not with elaborate thoughts, but with a subjective principle, a spark of experience. This may sound like mysticism, but it's not a new idea. Philosophers like Baruch Spinoza, back in the 17th century, already argued that mind and matter are two aspects of the same substance. And more recently, thinkers like Galen Strawson and Philip Goff have claimed that it makes no sense to try to explain how mindless matter could give rise to mind, unless matter itself already possesses, to some extent, a mental quality. The logic is provocative. If everything we are is made of particles, and those particles are the same ones that make up the universe, why would consciousness emerge only when those particles are arranged in a very specific way? Could it be that there is something conscious in every particle, and what we call human consciousness is just a highly complex form of this universal quality? This hypothesis could even help explain some of the mysteries of quantum physics. As we've seen, the mere act of observation alters the behavior of particles. But if there is some form of presence or observation in everything, then perhaps there was never a moment without an observer. Maybe the entire universe is a vast conscious field interacting with itself like a cosmic brain processing its own existence. This idea resonates directly with Carl Jung's belief that psyche and matter are two aspects of the same reality. Or more recently, with Rupert Sheldrake and his theory of morphic fields, which suggests there is a kind of collective memory that transcends the individual. These are bold attempts to reintegrate the human being into the totality of the cosmos. 
not as an external intruder trying to decode the secrets of nature, but as an integral part of a living, sentient organism. Of course, this pulls us out of our comfort zone, because if consciousness is in everything, then everything that exists somehow participates in the story of the universe. There are no more inert things, only different expressions of the same principle. This changes the way we look at a tree, a rock, the wind. It changes the way we see ourselves within the world, not as masters of nature, but as part of it, not as external observers, but as internal participants in a vast, mysterious and living system. The doubt, of course, remains. How can we prove this? The truth is, maybe we can't, at least not with the tools we currently have. But as the poet Rainer Maria Rilke once said, live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. And perhaps the most important thing isn't to find a final answer, but to keep exploring with humility, courage, and curiosity. Because if there really is a mind behind the cosmos, or if the cosmos is the mind, then every thought we have might be a whisper from the universe itself, trying to understand itself. That feeling changed the way I see the world. It made me wonder what else we're failing to see, or to feel. That's why I make these videos. Because I believe philosophy isn't just an intellectual exercise. It's a way of being more alive, more aware, more present. And if you feel the same way, know that this space is also yours. Thank you for joining me on this journey. Now I want to offer you something that isn't for everyone, but it is for you, you who made it this far, searching for deeper answers about who you are and where your life is headed. I created something that goes beyond a book. I built a map for the soul, a manual that blends science, philosophy, and critical thinking to help you break mental patterns, question your identity, and rebuild yourself from the roots. This is not just an e-book with beautiful quotes. It's a guide for those who can no longer bear to live on autopilot. If you feel like something inside you is asking for change, for growth, for clarity, then this is your moment. Click the pinned comment and get access now to the Manual of Self-Transformation. Don't read it out of curiosity. Read it because your life depends on it. And if you choose to begin this journey, you won't be the same at the end of the path. Now, if you haven't liked, commented or subscribed yet, I can only assume one of two things. Either you've reached nirvana and are beyond digital vanity, or you're a quantum observer waiting for the exact moment to collapse the reality of the subscribe button. So go on, click, comment, and share this with someone who, just like you, sometimes feels like the universe is whispering strange things. I promise that in the next video, we'll go even deeper into this veil of reality. And now, two videos are appearing on your screen. One reveals what might be the most overlooked secret of the human mind. The other might completely change how you understand time, but you'll only find out by clicking. See you there.